Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the roundtable, Today, Tomorrow, and the Future of Propulsion Systems. This session is sponsored by AVL. Your moderator is Bill Visnick, SAE International. You are invited to submit questions for today's roundtable through the SAE International's WCX app. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Visnick. Morning, Don. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us today for the. Uh, oh, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I think there's not a lot of feedback here. So, okay. Everybody, can you you hearing this? All right. Louder. Sort of okay. Louder, louder, please louder. Thank you. Uh, our roundtable today is uh, Today, Tomorrow, and the Future of Propulsion Systems. Uh, we have assembled here uh, six of the uh, more preeminent propulsion uh, experts, if you will, engineers all in the, in the field, uh, and one uh, academic as well with John over there. Uh, and we are uh, going to spend the next approximately an hour we hope exploring uh, topics and, 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 and ideas in the, uh, in the propulsion field that, uh, that we think everybody will find interesting. We hope you'll find it interesting. Please submit your questions. I think you've been prompted about how to do that. Uh, if you, uh, you want to do that, I'm hitting this button and now I've got nothing. Uh, so please do that as we proceed. Uh, we'll, we'll start with a, uh, with a brief introduction of everyone here as we go down the line so you'll know who that is. And, uh, and we'll go from there as we, uh, as we proceed into the, uh, the, the conversational and the dialogue part of this panel. So without uh, too much further uh, explanation of how this is going to go, we'll go uh, first to Dave Philippe here, who is uh, from Ford Motor Company. Dave will introduce himself and uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's on his radar, what he's thinking, and what he thinks are the, uh, the, the, the chief uh, uh, issues at the moment right now. Okay. Dave? Thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. Morning, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Um, Vice President of Powertrain Engineering globally at Ford, and um, you know, even in the, in the green room when we're all talking uh, together, just highlighting how busy we are, right? And uh, in the old days, 10, 15, 20 years ago, we were worried about Lev 3, Sue Lev. We were just worried about one thing. Now we have so much on our plates, and it's in the world of ice, it's in the world of electrification, globally. And for us, um, and I think maybe for other OEMs, I'm spending a lot of time trying to figure out where do we invest and how do we, how do we take those investments and provide value to the customers. Because with all the things we're doing in electrification, there, does, there is a cost element to it, but then how do we get to scale with our supplier partners, working hand in hand with them, but then also other OEMs, right? That's key, and that's been the tradition of our Ford Motor Company is how do we provide the value of the technology to the customers. Now, on that value equation to the customers, I think that's the other challenge, right? We're all working on the electrification piece, enhanced ice systems, and so on. But then, how do we how do we provide the additional why buy to the customer? Because they're not willing to pay a lot more money for these new vehicles, given that gasoline prices in the U.S. is under three dollars or around three dollars. So, again, all these strategies of delivering the technical, delivering the business equation, but then delivering the good why buy to the customer. And then the other challenge is you know, trying to keep up in the world of regulations. Um, you know, different standards in different countries, but even in the US, we've seen a departure from the one, the one national program. Uh, Bill Ford, our chairman of the board, had a discussion with President Trump a couple weeks ago to try to get the federal government and uh, California back on the same page because there's been the separation there. So again, we're trying to spend our energy you know, providing the value to the customer, getting to their needs, uh, a business equation that works for all of us. But these are great times. Our, our engineers are very, very busy, and uh, I think uh, we'll figure out our way forward. It's, these, are, these are demanding times in the industry. We're all forecasting what the next 10 years could look like, and uh, I'm not sure who's going to get it right, but at least we're keeping ourselves busy uh, to try to deliver that. 
Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Jeff Lux from uh, FCA North America. Jeff is a, uh, uh, a transmission expert in particular, but uh, he's been around propulsion for as long as I've been around. So, uh, Jeff, why don't you uh, tell us what's on your mind? Sure. So, th good morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, Jeff Lux, head of transmission driveline powertrain for FCA. Um, and I guess what the way I would frame it is it's almost axiomatic in engineering that coming up with a good solution depends on, on having the right problem statement. And when we talk about mobility, CO2, constituent emissions, things like that, I'm not sure that we've really gotten the whole problem statement quite right yet mm -hmm. between, between industry, regulatory agencies, and others. So I, I think that's still something that we need to work on. I'm confident if we, can, if we can get a good problem statement, I think we can get to good solutions that will do many of the things that Dave talked about in terms of making sure there's market acceptance, there's the right performance, and that we get the right trade-offs. So that's, that's what I see, and I would second Dave's comment about how busy we all are, so. And busy's a good thing, right? Busy's a good thing. Busy's a good thing, that means something's going on. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, next, we've got uh, Dante Boutel from Toyota uh, North America, and uh, Dante, please. Thanks, Bill, and I agree with uh, everyone else. Uh, good morning, my name is Dante Boutel. I'm the powertrain design vice president in North America, and that means focusing on hardware, hardware for the powertrain driveline, uh, electrification systems and engines. Um, uh, the biggest challenges, uh, for sure, are getting the balance right. You know, it used to be maybe a cost, quality, performance was the, the triangle. Uh, and now that's turning into, it, there's regulation, there's a, a new generation of customers, uh, there's new technology and manufacturing of, as well, uh, and the balance between uh, cost, quality, uh, performance is, is being turned a little bit upside down with all these new options, and it's uh, a big challenge for me to keep uh, the conventional piece going in North America, the North American manufacturing, anything that's manufactured in North America, hardware-wise, I'm, I'm in charge of the design. And, uh, of course, working with Japan. And, uh, of course, the new electrification piece. How fast, how much, what direction, uh, what's that consumer look like, what's that profit look like, what's that quality, what's the performance look like. These are big challenges for us. That's motivating to a lot of my engineers. Uh, a lot of the engineers, though, are starting to get nervous about what's their future look like. Um, so, as the companies are a little bit nervous over what the future is, uh, the engineers are too, so it's, it's kind of an exci exciting time um, to figure that out. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Dante. I think how fast and how much, we, you're gonna hear that a lot probably in the next 60 minutes, uh, but, but, but let's keep these in mind as themes as, as we move along, but how fast and how much is probably, could be the, uh, you know, the, the, the question of the day. Uh, we'll move next to, uh, to, to, to Tim Frazier uh, from Cummins. He's got a unique perspective from the, uh, the heavy duty world, the commercial vehicle side uh, of the business. And, and Tim, uh, tell, us, uh, tell us what's going on. Yeah, great. Is that, yeah, am I coming through? It's kind of quiet to me, but okay. So, hap, yeah, welcome to the Midwest, everybody. A nice cold day for, for us. <laughs> uh, two, two, three days ago, it was pretty nice. Today, not so much. So uh, yeah, the, the, the commercial vehicle uh, challenge is, is, is uh, running right along with what was just said, maybe with, with the one strong, significantly strong caveat that I would say, or two. Uh, the, in the commercial space, uh, it's a little bit of a joke to say we nearly have as many applications as trucks we sell, but it's not much of a joke. Uh, really, by the time we go through body fitters and by the time we actually apply it to how the customer is using it, uh, the, the opportunity for diverse um, um, diversity in the clustering of how customers use that vehicle and need to use it to do the work every day really makes uh, the future a, a significant challenge. And five years ago, we would have said we were on a trend towards the whole globe being nearly harmonized in the mission standards and the right technology in the commercial vehicle space. Certainly now it looks like not only will we have different national standards and different tests and different targets for those tests and different ways that that's measured in terms of a powertrain or at the vehicle level or in a pure simulation, uh, but we're going to have different states and different regional challenges inside those nations for sure. And in, in the commercial vehicle space, when you have that diversity of product use in those spaces and you have not a million models of any one sold, you have a real challenge because the first thing the customer really cares about 
Not that that's any different from PASCAR, but it is reliability. And the difference in the commercial space is that reliability of that vehicle is expected to last out for quite a long time. 15 years in most of our commercial applications is, uh, is sort of an expected trade cycle. Um, if, if they use a lot of miles early on in that, you're sort of talking about a million or a million two miles in durability. So uh, customers are in that market are extremely conservative because that's their daily job. And so figuring out how to invest um, in, in, in my role at Cummins, I lead the advanced engineering organization. So all the future technologies is my team's responsibility for making that recommendation. But, it, but I find it's twofold because uh, where we used to have one solution fit most everything mm -hmm. in terms of a powertrain, now we have a number of emerging solutions, but the total revenue line doesn't change. So I have to deliver two things, really. Not only what is the right suite of technologies, where four now goes into one, but I also have to improve the engineering efficiency, which, which I develop all four of those, if we want to still be profitable in the business. So some significant challenges in the commercial space. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more because it, maybe more than anything, the commercial side is so directly connected to the customer and these long-term needs really that they have. It's a huge investment and, and it's, uh, it is a little bit of a, of a difference than from, from passenger. Uh, next we have uh, John Haywood uh, from a place called MIT. Uh, MIT. John is, uh, has been a, a frequent guest at our panels and at WCX here. We're very pleased to have him again. John brings a unique perspective and uh, please tell us, uh, tell us what's up, John. Well, thank you. I've been uh, uh, doing research and teaching at MIT for more decades than I'll tell you, but I've got a lot of experience and a lot of connections and interactions with the, the industry that we are all involved in. And um, it's great to have these kind of discussions where we can go back and forth and exchange ideas and build some new ideas up that are important. A couple of points to get this discussion started. I think we've got to realize that too much of this discussion is, is looking for that silver bullet, that one solution that will solve our very challenging problems. And I'm particularly involved in the environmental impacts of the technologies that we use, and particularly passenger transportation. And, and I think we've got to realize that, no, 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 this is just not, it's not a one solution challenge. We've got to l explore all the various opportunities that we've got in the technology side, mainstream engines, new engines, several of them. And we've got to add up those pieces, particularly the ones that make sense, have appeal to the customer, will provide the service that they want, but also reduce their impacts. We, we've got to have multiple pathways and we've got to realize that we've got to dig in and add up the ones that can make a difference. And then second point is, we've got to get back to valuing what I'll call realism. There's too much blue sky discussion that is not grounded. Now, one of my mottos is the real world always wins out. Now we can lead it to change, but you can't beat the real world. And we've got to recognize that. And we've got to talk to each other in more useful ways. We've got to listen better and be less provocative and sound bites don't go deep enough. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, last, we have another John, John Jerigo from uh, Hyundai Technical Center here in North America, uh, not far down the road here. Uh, John, we'd like to hear uh, what's on your mind. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, I'm John Jerigo, Director of Powertrain uh, for uh, Hyundai Kia for North America. And, uh, you know, when we look at the title here, Today, Tomorrow, and the Future, and I'd like to start maybe by just providing a quote by Niels um, Bohr, a famous physicist that said, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. And I think that's what we're trying to do around here is to say, what should we be doing in the future? Well, when you take a look at a Hyundai Kia from our perspective, we are really the most global manufacturer, auto manufacturer in the world. And I say that based on the fact that we have no more than 25% of our market share in any one region. So we don't have any dominant market share. So we have to take a look at the whole global environment and the right technologies for those environments based on 
the market needs. And so we're pursuing uh, basically all the key technologies, and we put them in basically three buckets. So we have our internal combustion engines, and we think internal combustion engines are going to be around for many, many years to come. But we're focusing on mechanical, thermal, and biometric efficiencies. There's still ways that we can try and improve these to make them better and cleaner. And you know, there's a lot of technologies out there that that we're developing. Um, you know, one to speak of is you know com gasoline compression ignition as an example of one of those technologies where we can squeeze more out of our, our powertrains, especially for North America, to try and gain more fuel efficiency. The second bucket is very heavy electrification of those internal combustion engines, the hybrids, the mild hybrids. And there we're focusing on the things of how we do um, basically conservation of energy, you know, trying to make sure maybe we reduce the duty cycle of the internal combustion engine at times to try and operate more efficiently. Um, and then energy recovery, regeneration, which is key. And that's uh, a key enabler for us to try and improve the fuel efficiency. And then, of course, the third category is pure electrics. And we put those into battery electric and fuel cell. And we're very heavy, uh, heavily involved in both. And we have a lot of programs in both. And so we're focusing on all those. Now, everyone always asks, well, what's really going to win out? What's the right technology? And as Professor Hayward said, there's not a single technology. When we look at the global environment, and that, that's really what most major OEMs have to do, is we look at it and say, there's really simplifying everything. And I like to simplify things. Two basic markets, one in the urban areas. And we believe in most of the urban areas, and you'll see this in Europe as well as in Asia, um, electrification is really going to take hold. And there's going to be you know, a lot of good reasons for that. You can develop the infrastructure there. You can have shorter commutes. And, and the density of population and the pollution aspects are all there. So electrification makes a lot of sense. But then you take the other extreme when you have more rural areas, and a lot of the U.S. falls into that category, or emerging markets where dollars are very, very critical, and we have to go with more lower-cost technologies. And there's where the internal combustion engine, highly electrified, makes a lot of sense. So we're looking at all the different markets and have to play in those markets with that right technology for the market. So that's sort of our perspective on things. Okay, John, I think that's... Uh a summation of probably what a lot of people on the panel are, are, are thinking in terms of buckets and horses for courses, right? You know, where you're, you're going to have to look at it as not a, a binary kind of a market. You know, it's not either or. John said there's not a silver bullet. I think there, there's, there's going to be a lot of situational kind of application here probably. So we'll take care of a few of these thoughts right now. And thank you, we've been inundated with questions. So thanks everyone <laughs> for that too. Uh, we'll, we'll try to get some of these sort of formed up in because they are sort of taking on a theme here. And, and we mentioned how, how long and how fast and how much and all that. So we'll try to take a, care of a few of these right now. Um, one of the questions we've got here, and this is uh, duplicated a few, how long until IC only powertrains are extinct and all powertrains are hybridized? Now that's sort of assuming that we are going to hybridization, you know, and, and, and everything's going to be hybrid, hybridized. But, but we are really getting a lot of questions here, and, and this is something we talked about prior to this panel, everybody kind of wants to know how long and how fast and how quickly is this coming. And, and one of the, the tertiary questions here, given the diverse range of EV powertrains, will the in industry ever converge on a winner? Okay. And I think John already said, well, maybe that's not the way to look at it, a winner. So let's look at it like this then. Let's hit it right now. What is the tipping point? When will the tipping point be? We're seeing hybridization as sort of a, as sort of a way to, to, to sort of stretch the spectrum here a little bit in time sense. And, and Dante, I'm going to go to you first because Toyota's been in hybridization probably as long as anyone in terms of mainstream production. When, you know, how long, when, is everything going to be hybridized on the way to electrification or is there still always going to be a place for non-hybridized powertrain? Okay, um, so that's starting off easy. Um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, so first of all, uh, internal combustion engines, uh, we feel we're going to be around a long time. And how to define long, well, let's just say decades. Um, now the question is, whether the 
internal combustion engine will stand on its own or, or not? That's the question I think Bill right. is proposing. Right. Or, so the electrification of with the internal combustion engine is gaining ground and will continue to do, to do so, we feel. Um, there is going to be, I, you know, I still think, you know, looking at the cars that are on display here, did anyone notice that the electric vehicle had a 38% market share in 1900? And the steam car over there had a market share of 40% in 1900, but that only left 22% for what we're talking about, the IC, <laughs> uh, the right. internal combustion engine. So I think that hybridization will continue. Um, it, it, it's, a, it, it's certainly one path forward that seems to be well accepted on many different fronts. It performs well, the consumers are used to it now. Um, uh, the costs are coming down, the performance is still high. Uh, so that's, that's still happening. The IC in itself, when does it actually go all the way away? I, I think we're never going to, I don't think in my lifetime I'm going to see that go away. Uh, there's going to be applications for it, it might, and it might be a diesel, it might be uh, HCCI like John said. Um, it might be um, what, what we know now, uh, highly electrified or, or um, you know, efficiency is at 50% or higher. Uh, it, you know, it might be turbo, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we're going to see that uh, be around a long time. But the hybridization is slowly going to eat that away. And it's going to be a little bit of an asymptotic approach to, uh, to extinction that I don't think we're going to see for many decades. Okay, so, so Dave, hearing that and, hear, and, and knowing what's going on in this market in particular, everyone wants a pickup, everyone wants a, a large SUV. How does that affect the whole kind of uh, rollout of this and, and your own timeline, you know, as being the, the, the seller of the, the best selling pickup in America for what the last six decades or whatever, uh, you know, the F-150, what is the force, are, okay, wow, sound like a PR guy or something. <laughs> uh, how, you know, we, we really need to explore that for this market because there is a real bifurcation here in terms of us and the rest of the world, right, everybody? And I think John's got some ideas about this too because Hyundai is such a, you know, really West, rest of the world player. But, but tell us what you think in terms of a market that's so heavily invested right now in the larger sort of higher inertia weight vehicles. Yeah, all good points and uh, agree with the comments, especially what Dante had mentioned. Um, ICE is not going to go away overnight. Uh, we continue to invest in ICE technologies. We're launching a new Escape with a three-cylinder that has cylinder deactivation, right? Later this year, I'm going to introduce a new V8 7.3 liter gasoline <laughs> engine, top to bottom, all new. So we continue to invest in ICE technology. Um, we're all working on additional ICE technologies because the marketplace still needs that. Now, I think we're going to have maybe less diversity of the ICE lineup moving forward. We're not going to have every you know, displacement range that we have today, and we need to rationalize that because we're not going to be able to afford main, to maintain that. But the, the tipping point, back to your original question around um, the electrification starting to take over. Um, I don't know if we could forecast that yet. And I know we'll have regulatory pressures to keep building that in, but how do we get the customers to want the electrification as a value equation over the ice right. today, right. right? And in Ford, um, we back on the F-Series, um, back in the early 2000s, all of our F-Series were big V8 gasoline engines. Right? Today, 70% are boosted V6s. Right? So we made that evolution, we hit a tipping point where we provided this thing called EcoBoost to the customers. And at the time we were worried, <laughs> the, the marketplace was, it's all about, I have a truck product, I, all I know is V8s work, why do I want a turbocharger, high pressure direct injection V6 gasoline engine? But we provided an AND solution, we provided something that was a good winning recipe for and value equation for the customer. And I think for all of us in the technologies and you know, Toyota's done that with the hybrids and the number of their vehicles in the lineup in which it's provide a why buy. So how do we get that why buy to be at a tipping point? That's the challenge because just because we offer it up right now doesn't mean that they'll go buy it. Mm -hmm. Right? And I could put I put a PHEV or an FHEV in a Ford Fusion today, compromise the trunk space with the battery, it doesn't work. Right? We cannot offer compromised solutions. So 
we'll have to keep all working at it. Um, the ice technology is still key moving forward, but the tipping point for electrification, that's the challenge for all of us. How do we do that affordably? Jeff, uh, what about that do you think? Uh, you know, another uh, company that's, you know, that's heavily into the, you know, the, the truck side of the business. So, so I would say it very similarly. I, I think the tipping point will, will really have to depend on when the customer demand is there. That's, that's what will govern the tipping point. And, and like Dave said, that's going to be on when there's a compelling reason for the customer to want the technology. It's going to have to provide something more than regulatory benefit. I think people just expect that their car is fully compliant. They don't, they don't give it a moment's <laughs> thought when they make the purchase decision. And, and frankly, they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So um, to me, that, that's the real, the real challenge. And you know, when you hear the types of figures that people typically think they should have to pay for a hybrid, oh, maybe a thousand, maybe two thousand more than a conventional, if that, and, and I, I actually see a lot, of, a lot of things that say it's got to be on the other side. Hey, I'm taking a risk by getting this powertrain. I think it needs to be less expensive mm -hmm. than a conventional. So, so mm -hmm. there's, I see a lot of challenges in the marketplace still, but, but the, to your question about the tipping point, it, it depends on when the demand is there, when the mm -hmm. consumer demand is there. Maybe the commercial sector has something uh, you know to take away for everybody in this because really more than anything else that's that's the drive isn't it uh, w when you see customers that are so intrinsically tied to the investment part of the equation right Tim and you know you, you see where they don't do a thing right in the commercial sector if there's not a defined payoff somewhere in the life cycle of the vehicle right so Talk a little bit about that and what you think is, is is sort of the, you know, when do you get a customer? And, and you know, we know electrification is is rolling around in the heavy duty sector too. Uh, you know, when do you get a customer to decide to make that choice? Uh, Dave was sharing with me before the panel that, that he was talking to someone and said, well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I want to buy a gasoline engine vehicle right now. What if two years from now this is yesterday's technology? And I think we already know it's not going to be yesterday's technology two years from now. But, but, but what is that, you know, what can we learn from, you know, the, the commercial side and what, what's so important to them? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. In fact, the customer has the biggest choice in all of it. <laughs> and we don't make any improvements unless actually the customers buy the product. Um, and, and certainly when there's ambiguity in the direction of a long-term vision like a 10-year platform, we have to remember a lot of these customers do their own service and in-house mm -hmm. maintenance, which means they don't want a diverse portfolio in the garage. They'd mm -hmm. like to have one technology that wins and that technology mm -hmm. or tr a technician is just trained to support that. So a 10-year view for them, they need to really see some consistency before they jump in, um, and, they, and, and they will defer their selections if there's not if there's not a real clear path there. But in the commercial space, I'll, I'll lead back to what I just started with early on. Um, in some spaces in the commercial business, like transit bus in urban or school bus in urban applications, because of policy, because of social pressure inside those urban centers, because of air quality, you might say tipping points there. I mean, you see mm -hmm. emergence of electrification in those space, Cummins is participating in that. Um, there are competitive, really good competitive answers in that space that we also offer in terms of natural gas and, and, and now the emergence of the lower emissions uh, uh, diesel technologies that we're working on. So, but there, you might say that the tipping point is already there, but certainly take line haul, uh, long haul trucking, there, there isn't a good all electric solution. <laughs> right. There isn't a lot of kinetic energy to recover in a drive cycle of a class A truck with hybrid. And so that's why you also see Cummins investing and others that are in that business mm -hmm. investing really significantly in the efficiency of the powertrain. And you know, over, over the course of like two decades ago, over the course of that decade, we dropped NOx and PN by a couple of order of magnitudes. In the course of this decade in the research side of things, we've taken a class A truck from like six and a half mile per gallon average up to demonstrating capability at 14 mile per hour, mile per, hour, mile per gallon efficiency on the road, right? Loaded truck on the road, in use mm -hmm. cycles. That, I mean, that's a huge increase, right? Mm -hmm. Powertrain efficiencies, engine efficiencies at 55% will be demonstrated in the next couple of years, and I have internal targets for my programs to go up to 57% efficiency at the engine level, at the powertrain engine level. 
And so that does tend to erode the value story of why you move to electrification. Right. And you suddenly That's get right. freight efficiencies improving by 140% compared to a decade ago, which is the benchmark of the stuff we're trying to outsource. So, so I, I, I'm pleased to hear in the fast car industry and the commercial space, my colleagues say that ICs will be around for a long time. I certainly think in the commercial vehicle space, it's going to be a, a, a a suite of technologies because some will move and policy is going to drive that, but, but the IC engine is going to be around for, all, for, for a long time in that space. And, it, and we got to recognize, I think this is what John was getting at a little bit. <laughs> Anytime we invest these new technologies and uh, the OEM comes with an answer, but it requires infrastructure to come with another answer, mm -hmm. it becomes that Texas two-step of how far do you get ahead the rest of the investment. Right, and so uh, uh, customers will recognize that too if they don't have the ability to run their vehicle because they're not sure they're going to be able to power it or fuel it. So that that plays huge into this equation. That's what I think. That's great. also leveraging the uh, the and, and recognizing the investment to change not just the rolling capital but the infrastructure to support it is really huge. That's a great point, Tim, because we've talked about that before as a team. Um, at, at NAIPC last, last uh, September in Chicago, a lot of discussions on fuel cells, right? And I think that technology is there, mm -hmm. right? But then there were presentations around the infrastructure and it costs, whatever it was at the time, uh, five times more just to transport the hydrogen and then the installation costs at the facilities are 15 times more than a petrol station. So you're absolutely right, be it for fuel cell or battery, I brought up in the discussion, what do we do with the batteries when, the, when we're done using them in the vehicle, right? What does the life cycle and recycling strategy look like? Because we need help to hit that tipping point with infrastructure and the recycle elements um, to help it be acceptable in the market, right? It can't be just the OEM, so very good point there. John, John go ahead. Yeah, you look I like you this, want to say I something. I think this <laughs> discussion is captured by a couple of really good questions to ask oneself and to ask someone you're talking with about the, these tipping point transition issues. A and they came out of an op-ed piece in Automotive News, but the two questions were, is this new technology um, convenient to the user? That's a very important question, and we know what that means. The, the other question was, is it compelling? Now that's a little less clear, a major piece of that was the financial side. Is it cost effective? But also it's what are the operating characteristics that it offers to the user that, that make it a positive transition? They're very demanding questions and, and I ask myself those questions when I'm looking at some new technology opportunities. And I think we should all ask ourselves those questions because they capture the consumer side and then, if you like, the technology side, and they've both got to be positive. Yeah, maybe, Bill, just Go to ahead, elaborate on what uh, Professor Hayward's saying, you know, as you said, the real world's going to win out. And the, the challenge that we all face is the fact that, you know, when we look at the U.S. market, we have very, very low gas prices, which is somewhat unique for, for the world. And then we also don't have a, for good, bad, or indifferent, um, a strong push towards concerned with climate change. In, in the US, most customers are more pragmatic. They're going to look at, at the cost of the technology and the features. And what we're, as manufacturers, are tied into is we also have to meet the regulations that are coming down that are very real to us. So we got to make sure our products are designed and developed so that those customers want those products. We can put an EV out there, but if no one buys it, what good is it? So we got to figure out how to make those products exciting. So if any of you have driven an EV, it's a fun to drive vehicle. And those are the features that we have to add to our products so we get the customers to want to buy those products because there's a trade-off. They are more expensive. So how do I get someone to drive and buy a hybrid or an EV um, for a lot of good reasons, but to them, what makes them really want that? And I got to give them something. And if I can't, it won't sell. It's as simple as that. So it's, it's, it's a very pragmatic business case. And as engineers, we have to be savvy businessmen as well. And so we got to figure out how to get those customers to really want that. And so that's our real challenge is the technology can be developed and it is in many cases mm -hmm. available. It's just that how do we make it cost effective and 
as you said, cost and convenient for customers that, that they want it. Otherwise, it's, it's we're putting using space on the uh, showroom floor that is just a waste of time. Let's use that then to go into this next question, which is an intriguing one from the audience. Can you talk a little about the end user experience? At some point, will performance suffer in the name of efficiency? So, you know, when, and look, we've seen this talk around, you know, okay, we've got to get the emissions down, we've got to get the fuel economy up. Uh, you know, Dave mentioned that, okay, we've got V6s now, turbocharged V6s in place of a V8 in full-size pickup trucks, and I think he would argue that performance hasn't suffered at all and efficiency has improved. But is there a point, and, and there's also some questions here about is government too involved in the the whole spectrum of, of trying to determine what technologies win or lose. So let's talk about that a second. You know, it is, can we expect performance to suffer at some point or is that a non-starter with automotive customers, <laughs> okay? Don't tell me there's not going to be any more performance that we're still going to keep going there. Uh, who wants to, say, Jeff, you look like you want to hit okay. that one up uh, first. Let me, let me try, I, I think the last time we saw performance <laughs> suffer as a result of emissions was probably mid the to 70s, late 70s right? into, the, yeah, into the 1980s. Right. I don't know that there's going to be much appetite to repeat that, and I think that, that okay. that'll be the challenge. If somebody thinks that's okay, I'm willing to bet there'll be others who think it's not okay, mm -hmm. and, and there'll be the ones that will that'll win in that competition. So um, I, I would say we've got to approach that with extreme care, and it, it's back to, to, it's a modification, I think, of what John said about it needs to be convenient as well as compelling, and it, that to me is part of it. It's not directly convenience, but it's part of mm -hmm. making the overall user experience attractive and worthwhile. So, um, I, I don't see that as being a very uh, bright path. That's to not a on. sell, right? Yeah. yeah. Dave, what, what do you think? Totally agree. Yeah. Uh, we've all tried that before. The customers are not looking for any compromise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And uh, I agree. All right, but then okay, so. Let, let's take it one step further. Some people have said for years that hybridization was kind of a compromise, right? That performance wasn't there, and, and uh, you know, again, let, let's let's try to bring that into the hybrid discussion, uh, and and think, Dante, what you know, you sell a lot of hybrids, right? People have said, ah, yeah, they're a little whiny, they're a little, yeah, not quite so so fun to drive sometimes. Uh, you know, what do you think? Uh, I mean, we've got performance hybrids too, though, right? Uh, Right, it's a good question. I think there will, there's always a, there's always this funny part of the market that will accept anything, or <laughs> wants anything, or wants something different, right. even in, even if inconvenient. Maybe it's just style or or, or luxury or, or or something interesting. Um, but I think we want to talk maybe about the bulk of the market here. Uh, so hybrids, yeah, Toyota introduced those late '90s, um, and at first they were a little quirky and they were a little bit early adopter-ish. Um, they were touted as uh, environmental, I think. And people sacrificed some convenience, maybe a little bit of reliability concerns, maybe they compromised some performance. And that's all true. Um, but now we've seen hybrids be a performance machine. I, I think did not hybrid, you know, uh, hybrids have won the Le Mans 24 hour endurance race, for example. I mean, they're, 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 they have performance. They can't have performance. Of course, with performance comes sometimes comes cost. And then we come back to the business case that John talked about. We can't just sell something that doesn't make money, or doesn't make sense, or doesn't please a regulation. Uh, people want to have these. So, w but I, I totally agree with Jeff and David. There's not a lot of appetite in the bulk of the market to have something that doesn't perform well, mm. or isn't convenient. And companies don't have a lot of appetite to sell something that doesn't make money. So there's this, th th this, this strange relationship that accelerates technology, but at the same time, sometimes holds it back you know, it, it, in this strange relationship between government regulations and customer demand, these are just huge forces, like uh, like uh, Tim talked about. Um, no different than than your industry, I'm sure. So, I, I think we have to appeal to the customers. And if it's a hybrid, it, it's going to have to have performance too. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of appetite. There's less and less tolerance for things that are that don't work well. Okay. So let, let's move this yeah, into, can I, can uh, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. I mean, first thought, I think in a lot of applications, I wouldn't call hybrid a, comp, uh, a compromise. I think in a lot mm -hmm. of applications in the commercial space, it's in, a hybrid technology is going to be, going to be the it, yeah. preferred technology in, in, for some extended period of time, quite likely. But I do want to jump in on the, uh, the 
the piece that I think is really important for, for all of us up here is but we, there's sort of there's sort of a five-year race and a 10-year race and to have the vision and uh, clarity of regulation and enforcement over a long window gives us an opportunity to innovate towards the long window the performance piece that I am a little bit worried about if we play this in two five-year sprints is can we actually in, in afford to invest and put the time into making the right technologies for five years and then a whole new set mm -hmm. of other technologies for the next five years if we don't have clarity of the 10-year view now. Mm -hmm. And so how that affects the customer will affect a, a different kind of performance, that's pocket performance, and it may affect them, unfortunately it may affect them in the reliability expectations of the product too if we don't have a long-term glide path to mature the technologies in the field. Well, there's, uh, there's some questions here right now in, in, in getting to that sort of horizon, what is the horizon, about the government's role in all this. And right now we do seem to have some uncertainty, right, about what, what, where, you know, where we're going to be going in terms of, you know, particularly light vehicle uh, emissions regulations and ultimately the fuel economy uh, that, that, that sort of goes hand in hand with that. And uh, you know, maybe you can give us some ideas what you all have about this idea of you know how do you work towards a sort of an uncertain horizon? Uh, you know, we know that that in general it's still got to improve. You know, that that the fuel economy has to improve, that emissions have to to, to continue to come down. But uh, would you, I guess, uh, you know, and without trying to get this in too much in the political realm, would you like to see something certain? Would you like to see 50 state regulation that everybody can can live with? Uh, John, what, John Jerigo, what do you think about that? Sorry, we'll get to you too, John. Sorry. Yeah, a single standard would be awesome. I think everyone would love that. The reality yeah. is it, it's not going to happen, and none of us hmm. really believe it will ever happen. Um, because Why? Why? Because I think you have too much diversity in, in the country, you know, between California and, and the section 177 states, you know, basically the East mm -hmm. Coast and West Coast are somewhat different in demands than, than mid-America. And because of that, I think you have that diversity of demands mm -hmm. and therefore I think the regulations are going to stay different. Um, that doesn't mean we can't deal with both, it just makes our life more difficult. And you know, from, from our particular perspective, we have to go on the premise of, of the California standards are going to be there, and, and the California and east, Eastern Coast take up such a large percentage of the market share because of just population. We cannot avoid that. You have to accept that as fact. And so we're proceeding with that. And if, if regulations um, from the federal standpoint are um, reduced or, or, or deferred, that makes life maybe a little easier for mm -hmm. those, but we have to still go to the, the lowest common denominator of, of the toughest standard and uh, make sure we're capable of that. John Hayward, the, what, I mean, come on, we, we got to be able to get together on something, like, you know, at least in this country, if not for the world, but this country. Wouldn't that suit the whole you know, geopolitical aspect of this if we all went to, say, California standard? <laughs> I sometimes thought, how would I set regulations? It's a very challenging task. There are a lot of details you somehow got to get right enough. But, but I do think there's two big flaws in how we've been behaving, and particularly right now. The industry needs long lead times. But if you try and set standards going out 10, 15, 20 years, you've got to have some flexibility and some correction points built in. And that was supposed to be in the 2025 standards leading up to the 2025 requirements. And we studied that and we felt the technology is not going to be available enough in, volumes that, in the volumes needed to meet those requirements. And right now, the action taken has just put it into limbo because we don't have future standards and there's uncertainty, mm -hmm. particularly in relation of the federal to the California uh, requirements. And I, way back, I was involved when catalytic converters came in. Was the technology ready? The end result was the introduction requirements of that new technology were delayed. 
And it was done a year at a time. I did a study that said, don't do that. Do it in one piece, five years. And, and I really made this recommendation based on work we've done, looking at the 2025 standards and leading up to it. Our projections suggested five years later, <coughs> you'd get pretty close to those numbers, but not by 2025. Mm -hmm. But that seems to be off the table. So in other words, we, we've got to get sensible, useful discussions, recognize lead time needs, recognize some adjustment, try and keep that adjustment as unpolitical as possible. But then we can move forward in, in what I'd call a more rational way, but rationality is not really in fashion at the moment, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Jeff, is, is, is it, you know, as, as a globalized company, and just about everyone is globalized now, I mean, is this, is this still like the, the, the endless pursuit that's never going to happen then, uh, one sort of unified standard, if the least for this country anyway? So, I think it'll be, as, as John said, be very difficult in this country to reconcile even California with the federal state. So we'll, we're going to see how that one plays out here over the, mm -hmm. the coming years. I think if we extend that to, to international standards being harmonized, I see, okay, nothing's, I guess, completely impossible, but I see that as extremely unlikely. I mean, when I, when I listen to regulators talk in different regions, it's unfortunately, and I'm not quite sure why this is, but it almost seems viewed as an assault on national sovereignty to suggest <laughs> that we should have one global standard. And it shouldn't be that way, because if you truly think about kind of a cost-benefit equation, that should give us the most benefit at the lowest cost. But I, I just see it as too, too hard a hill to climb, ultimately, to, to get to a global standard. Would be wonderful, but okay. I just don't see it right. as very likely. And, and it's, a, it's a moving target. You know, mm. we always look at for the last 10 years, 2025, I mean, that was at this target. And it's like, whew, when 2025 gets here, we're all done. It's like, <laughs> no, it right. doesn't end. Right, yeah. it, it's, it, what's the next 10 years, the next 10 years? There'll be new standards coming out. And someone's going to have to lead those new standards, and there's plenty of people, especially out in California, that want to take that lead to say, this is what you should do the rest of the country or the rest of the world. And as long as that exists, and, and I don't see that changing, you're going to have constant influx of standards and changing, and, and more often than not, they're going to be more stringent. And so therefore, it, it, you may be, there's, there's not an equilibrium. There's not going to be a status quo. It's just going to be constantly changing until there are no emissions. Dave, I, I'm going to go into this one now because we, we talked about this a little prior to this panel too. And this turns this sort of turns the emissions thing a little bit, turns this argument some, and I'd like everyone to, to comment on this one. In terms of the ICE versus electrification sort of argument, if you will, and, and what's going on all over the world, and you see, particularly in Europe, you know, there's a lot of talk about bringing no emission zones into play now, whether it's uh, in urban, you know, central city cores or, or in other ways. Is ICE being demonized now at this point? Do you feel like there's almost an atmosphere of demonization that's happening with ICE and that's going to be the thing that sort of propels EV more into the forefront, kind of whether you like it or not, okay? And secondly, maybe, well, what does that still mean? The electricity we all know comes from somewhere that makes emissions, right? So it's maybe not a tailpipe equation because EVs don't you know have really individual emissions but those emissions are somewhere but at the end of the day is I uh, is ICE being demonized do you feel it sure feels that way in Europe almost now yeah I think um, unfortunately for the diesel engine world it's been going through a big transition over the past two to three years and um, the demonization you could say it started with the political side of things but it's rippled through the consumer base, right? Mm -hmm. The residual value impacts, city banning, et cetera, and there's, there is a perception in the diesel customer market, in the, in the European market, that you know, I don't think I want a diesel, and they're looking for alternatives. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the alternatives, um, hybrids have increased in Europe in recent months, and other options, and obviously there's a lot of discussion of electrification. Now, it doesn't mean diesel's dead in Europe. I think it will hit an equilibrium, and maybe a may have equalized in recent months. Everybody's we're seeing whether or not it plateaus. Yeah. But the continued pressures, and we just talked about you know, the, uh, the regulatory to CO2, um, and for Ford, uh, we're committed to the Paris Accord, right, two degrees a year, and we track that. 
So we still have to work it. It is complicated, mm -hmm. like John Dorigo mentioned, if by one national program in North America, that makes it much easier, but we don't. We have to deal with the realities of that. But if we're on that glide path, <clears throat> coupled with the tighter emission standards coming, so back to the diesel and some of the challenges in recent years, we now have this world in Europe of stage seven. And as we deal with stage seven, <clears throat> what are the solutions there? And does that become the tipping point for electrification, or does that, combine with electrification, do you use that in conjunction to deliver both? Both the CO2, both the tighter standards. Um, there's supplier partners out there talking about electric heated catalysts, because if you hybridize a diesel powertrain, is that an enabler of a mm -hmm. electric heated catalyst? So I think there's going to be more technology solutions, but the uh, probably the biggest one that we're all dealing with is the world of diesel, and for those of us who are launching diesel engines in North America, to get through carb these days is very challenging. Um, so that's that's the power pack that I say it's going to get its most demonized right now. But we'll get through that, and it'll e have an equilibrium point. But it may have a tipping point moving forward, and as we, as electrification comes. Jeff is demonized a little too strong a word there. So first, it depends on which markets we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't feel that ICEs are really demonized here in North America. No, definitely if, not. If, yeah. if you go to Europe, I think there, there, there is and has been a reaction against diesel gates, some other things, and, and like you mentioned about the city centers with the no emission zones. So I think there's been a, been a, a very strong reaction, but as, as Dave said too, you've seen diesel make a little bit of a comeback in Europe. I think it'll plateau at a lower level than what it had been at. But, uh, but you basically, if, if something gets demonized as an initial reaction, you say, okay, well what's, what's the next best alternative? What am I going to do instead? Okay. And I think particularly in Europe with you know, higher speeds on the highway, some other things, people are saying, well, there's, there are alternatives for certain use cases, but not for all. So, so I think there was, it was a reaction. If anything, I see the pendulum recentering somewhat, but uh, I, I, I don't know. So um, we'll, we'll see how it, how it comes back. But I, I, see the, I see it moving away from a more demonized to a less demonized position at the moment. Or at least some yeah. moderation, moderation, maybe, yeah. of this. Okay. Yeah. Dante, what, what do you say about demonization? I agree with uh, David and Jeff. There's certain markets and there's certain circles. There's circles of technology, technologists, maybe, in California that <laughs> just say that's not good, that's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And there's circles in, in the urban centers, of course, in Europe um, that say that's not going to happen. Um, but it, it's not, I think demonize is a little strong, especially in the United States. I you know, agree with Jeff that it, there's still a strong market and acceptance for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I still think there's a use for that. There's still a use case for those, those type of engines, uh, uh, whether it be diesel or, or gas. Um, so, uh, yeah, a little bit, but it's just finding maybe a new equi equilibrium. Tim, there's no no real alternative in the commercial sector, right? Yeah, right what's now, a what's the diesel guy say? Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, what 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 do you have to say to people? I mean, there there really is no alternative in the in the true line line vehicle market, well, right? Well, you know, so Cummins markets aren't just line haul; they're mm, sure, pretty everything. broad footprint. So, yeah. you know, so I think in the urban centers where we you know, we saw an awful lot of tra powertrains in the transit bus. Mm -hmm. There's two really good answers that we have today. Electrification technologies that we're selling now and we have a renewable natural gas product that runs uh -huh. 0.02 gram NOx. Uh -huh. In fact, it runs probably less than that on those cycles. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a pretty outstanding answer. Yeah, uh, well, it's a good alternative at least anyway. What about fuel cell? Is that something that's still possible for... for so, so uh, across our global uh, and, and mobile and non-mobile application space, we're pretty active even in the fuel mm -hmm. cell development. Mm -hmm. um, certainly as you look at the long range and power generation space, there's a real opportunity in some things like data centers to consider how do you reduce the overall capital footprint, how do you improve the efficiency in those data right. centers with a solid oxide fuel cell. That sounds pretty good. Um, and certainly in the mobile application that, that Solid oxide fuel cell might be a bit of a challenge, but we're pretty active in looking at the other opportunities that exist. And if you look down the road, you can certainly see a bridge that if, if that infrastructure ever played out, or if you had domicile fleets that returned the base and you could get the capital cost of the refueling on site down to something reasonable, maybe that's an answer. So a part of our customer choice model, the mm -hmm. technologies that my group's investing in to figure out what's right for Cummins, we, we certainly are looking at fuel cells as, a, as an end game solution to bridge from hybrid and IC engines into a fuel cell of the future and, 
and if, I, and if the fuel cells don't happen right, we're investing in high efficiency engines and hybridization to make that transition well. So that's the kind of game we're having to play. But I, yeah, I don't, I don't think at the moment there are a lot of really good answers for a lot of those applications. Right. Right. Um, I don't know that I would call it demonized. That what I think those, what what I think is trying to happen is upgrade old technology to new to new mm -hmm. technology, which mm -hmm. I think is an opportunity for us to make a positive impact. Well, everyone wants their UPS and Amazon package to arrive, right? So they, you know, until we until we get over that, maybe I, I think it's tough to, to in, in the heavy duty sector in particular to say, well, I, you know, you, we'll, we'll force something on you. But John Hayward. Uh, Demonization effect on the the larger uh, scene. What what do you think about that? Well, I'm willing to say yes in certain arenas. I think the political arena, parts of the environmental movement, media is not too bad, um, in my judgment. Mm -hmm. It <laughs> depends what you read, but what I think we've got to do. If we stand up and say the IC engine is being demonized people will stop listening to us, and we don't want that. So, <laughs> so we've got to talk about this in a different way. And let me take the greenhouse gas and then the air pollution arenas. Uh, greenhouse gases, if you really dig into life cycle assessment of the various technologies in given areas of application, and do the balancing, take a given vehicle, the numbers are, are, are less extreme. In other words, take a standard gasoline engine as your base, average electric vehicles now, and projecting into the future, it doesn't expect to change, but the emissions are about half, the greenhouse gas emissions. They're not a tenth, they're about half, and very dependent on how clean the electricity generating grid is that provides the electricity. And then hybrids and fuel cells are about 0.7. Now it's not one down to 0.1 with hybrids at 0.4. People don't know those numbers, and those are real numbers. Lots of groups have been digging in, and they're more robust. So you've got to get that kind of information out in a useful way, which says that, yes, battery electric vehicles are mostly are cleaner in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but not as much as you think. And we'd really better work on all of these options, because they, they all can and should get better. Now, take the air pollutant emissions and take the diesel engine. We've really got to clean up the diesel engine, and we've got to do that, we've got to make a splash, when we succeed, we've got to make a splash, because it has surprised us that diesels, passenger cars, and, and heavy duty, in these European cities that we thought were getting significantly cleaner, they're not as clean as we hoped they would be. So, and diesel gate and stuff hasn't helped, but. The diesel's really got to get on top of its emissions problem, and if we got some exciting new technology that genuinely works, it might do it. Otherwise, it's got a really bad sort of public image. People, particularly in the air pollution area, and then that's complicated, because where is the power station? How many of them burn coal? And then where, relative to the urban area, center of the urban area, where the air pollution is worse? And, and so we've got to get help through the media, get the public to, to, to realize the situation and think about it in a more sophisticated way. John Jiriga, demonization, we're still there on demonization? Um, yeah, I, I think in certain areas, demonization is, is absolutely taking this effect, in, especially in, in certain places in Europe. But I look at, that's okay, because the customer is always right. If they want something else, our job mm -hmm. is to give it to them. Mm -hmm. And you know, if they want to drive EVs, EVs with the ranges that we have now are, are very, very useful vehicles. And when we start getting to the you know, DC fast charging, they become very viable technologies. There's still a cost that we have to overcome. And with some volume and, and some advancements in technology, battery technology, we can bring that cost down quite a bit, not necessarily comparable. But if the customers want that type of powertrain, um, I say, more power to them, and we'll provide that to them. Okay. What's the best way to introduce electrification 
Uh, is this is this going to be sort of another one of those five year, ten year things that, that that Tim talked about, or you know what what's going to be? You think the best way? Again, this is the land of trucks, right? And SUVs and big high inertia weight vehicles. Uh, what's going to be the best way to introduce electrification? Uh, anyone can sort of take a flip at that if you want. Make it convenient for the customer, low cost and fun <laughs> to drive. You know, I mean, those are all easy or said that than done. That sounds easy enough. <laughs> right, <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> but, you know, you got to give the customer something they want as we talked. And I think EVs are inherently torquey. They, they can be very fun to drive. But they may not be necessarily good for all the types of vehicles. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I personally think an EV pickup may not necessarily be the greatest. You know, that, that right. may not be the right area for those products, but there's a lot of products that are good. Mm -hmm. So, you EV know. EV pickup? Dave? <laughs> I'll, I'll start with, because um, I agree with all the comments. Um, from an electrification standpoint, we started this year um, in our heavier trucks mm -hmm. with a P2 hybrid, so rear wheel drive based. Um, we announced and showed it at the North American International Auto Show here in the Explorer. And the theme for us, it has to be no compromise. That's what we've been talking about, right? So we're going to have a large SUV with no compromises. Battery package is invisible to the customer. Um, it's going to tow, it's going to deliver the fuel. It's going to tow 5,000 pounds, right? So that, that segment is, has towing, it has off-road, and it's going to have all this great off-road capability. Um, and it's going to be fast, right? Off the line, fast, fun to drive, mm -hmm. like we've been talking about. And we're so confident in it, we're even putting in our police interceptor vehicles mm -hmm. and really putting it at a challenge there. So Thanks a lot for that. You're welcome. Way, yeah. um, <laughs> so uh, you could see, and, and we've already announced that we're going to take that P2 hybrid system and put it in our F-Series, right. right? That's where right. it's going next. And it's going to do more. So mm -hmm. again, we're all talking about, it's got to be an and solution to the customer, no compromises because you know, with everything that's going with the CO2 pressures, that's going to have to be our challenges moving forward, is how do we deliver something that, in these heavier vehicles, what are the technologies that deliver that AND solution? So that's why we're launching this all new P2 rear wheel drive hybrid system. Electrify the transmission, Jeff, what do you think? Well, yeah, I think a lot of the electrification solutions end up living in the transmission. Um, mm -hmm. But, but fundamentally, it, it's, it's about the things that we've talked about, right? That whether we talk about tipping points or other things about how do we provide customer value. Um, in our products too, we've tried to, to take an approach that it has to be an and solution for the customer as Dave was describing it. Um, we've announced that we're going to have a hybrid Wrangler here coming up and that's something where we'll, we'll enhance and amplify the capabilities of the, of the combustion engine vehicle. So um, we need to, to, to get some of these products out See, what, see how the market reacts, what's the feedback that we get, and move from there. And hopefully the customer does realize some real benefits to the point that when it comes time to get their next car, now instead of saying, gee, I'm uncertain, this is something maybe I'll try, to this is something I have to have. Mm -hmm. We've got to get to, to that point to make it attractive, and then, then I think we stand a chance of getting it to grow. Dante, most of Toyota's electrification efforts so far has been on board the vehicle, right? You know, you don't have a, you know, you don't have to worry about sort of where the electricity is coming from. You have some plug-ins. You've 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 more moved more into that market. But what do you think about how the best way to introduce electrification is from in terms of a plug of infrastructure? So a lot of the questions here are asking about infrastructure too. When are we and are we prepared to make the national infrastructure investments that are are required? Well, what's your thinking about how the best way is to introduce EV in the infrastructure? So I think the EVs to, uh, today are, um, they're, they're for a niche market, uh, they're fun, uh, they're for technologists, um, hmm. uh, okay. maybe they're uh, uh, considered a toy um, among the affluent, for example. Hmm. Okay. And that can get so much market share, just with a, maybe a small glide path with a little help from the government, a little a little uh, help from uh, the new generation of customers. But to make that breakthrough, uh, we need to have it, uh, it, ha it has to get some cost parity, uh, as John said. Uh, it has to be fun to drive, like uh, Jeff and David say. Um, it, it has to have 
some other incentive. It has to either work well with the grid, uh, it has to be greener, like Professor Haywood said. Uh, battery recycling is not, is not there yet. It, it's going to be with more volume. The cost will come down with more volume. Technology breakthroughs, but we need, it, I think that there's going to be some uh, consumer pressures, there's going to be some political pressures, there's going to be some technology driving some breakthroughs, uh, some cost parity. I don't know if we're ever going to see, well, I, this is, I, I can't, maybe, this is maybe a little bit personal opinion. I'm not sure if we're going to see an inflection point in the EV market share, the mm. pure EV market share. I'm not sure if we're going to see a knee in that curve in the market share. Yeah. Um, we're going to see it steadily increase. I, 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 I'm with you there. Uh, where is that, is it just a straight glide path? Or is, it, is there going to be some sort of kicker? Um, and that's going to take some breakthrough, which I, I can't say there will or won't be, and I can't say when, of course. But, um, but you can't ignore the customer, and you can't ignore the greenness of it, and you can't ignore the performance of it and, and the convenience of the charging. I, I, I just think there's just some, some headwinds there for, right. for massive right. knee-bending inflection points in the, in the market share. Well, I can't resist this one. It's sort of moving into that because a couple of the questions here are asking specifically, is the pressure from ICE and hybridiz or from EV and hybridization going to continue to drive, and I think the answer here is kind of obvious, but is it going to continue to drive improvement in ICE technology uh, so, that, so that you can continue to still make it difficult, right, for the electrification aspect to move in? At our High Efficiency Engines Conference a couple of days ago, uh, there was a fascinating uh, presentation there uh, that, that suggested uh, we can get ICE to close to 50% thermal efficiency. Uh, at that point, boy, electrification, maybe it is a little more difficult to make the case, but will, will, will this all sort of create this kind of, uh, you know, tension, I guess, if you will, that, that okay, if, if, if we've got electrification, the ICE guys are still going to continue to, to, to hammer away at that because it is this sort of incumbent technology. John, you're shaking your head there. Uh, Jariga, yeah, <laughs> yeah right. John Jariga. Yeah, they don't have to fight each other. I mean, everything we do to improve thermal, volumetric, mechanical efficiency mm -hmm. on the internal combustion engine, and then incorporate some of the regeneration aspects of a okay. hybrid, um, is just, a, it's a win-win. And conserva mm -hmm. conservation of energy is always a good thing. So that's what we have to focus on, is how do we just make efficiency improved in both aspects. And I think that merger is, is where you'll see the growth happen. Straight EVs in certain markets, yes, but it's not going to go across the board. What mm -hmm. you're going to see is that efficiency improvement and highly electrified systems come together, and, and I think that's going to be that gradual improvement that the industry and the world needs. Dave, you look like you're pretty well, much agree. in agreement yeah. there. Yeah. That, that uh, there, you know, if you can get an ICE engine better and you know thermally uh, more efficient. That just makes a more efficient hybrid too, right? I mean, you just take it down the line. John Hayward. Let me connect this topic with the, the previous one because what there are constraints on currently on how large the battery electric vehicle market can grow. And they're largely around recharging. And really to make it viable and attractive, you need to have home recharging. Currently, 85% or so of the energy that's going into batteries on today's electric vehicles is done with home recharging. Now, now you've got to ask the question, well, of the 100 million households in the US, roughly, how many live in homes? What's a home? Well, we're, we're mid mid to high end professionals, we have homes, most of us. That means we've got a house, we've got a driveway, we've got a garage, we've got electricity coming into our home. How many people don't live in that kind of home? That's really a constraint at present on the penetration of the battery electric vehicle technology into the fleet. Mm. Absolutely. And then you say, well, we'll have public charges everywhere. I is every parking meter going to become a <laughs> on the street charger? How many people park on the street overnight? How many are in a large uh, uh, area of apartments with massive parking? Lots of questions. We might spend the money to resolve these things, but it's a serious constraint. And now the ICE side, 
there are gas stations. The, the land in urban areas of these gas stations is becoming more valuable than the, mm -hmm. what they make out of selling gasoline. But there's plenty of gas stations. So that's, that's an absent problem. So looking at these, the, in a sense, the relative attractiveness is going to continue to be an issue and question but there's lots of opportunities in all of these places, both on the ICE side and, and the battery electric side. And I think it's surprising the hybrid isn't doing better, which in some sense couples with both of these opportunities. And I think it's a challenge to us engineers in the industry. Let's take the hybrid system and, and find the really optimum combinations of components that give us good performance, really good performance, and that efficiency benefit that you get out of all electrified vehicles. And we can do it. This takes time. That's a very optimistic way to end this panel, I think, John. Thank you. <laughs> As we see the clock literally tick down to 0.01 there. So thanks, everyone. Uh, these guys are, uh, have, have given us tremendous insight today. Uh, I don't think we've got the number that everybody out there wants to hear is when is it going to be more ICE than, or more EV than ICE, but nobody really knows that number. Nobody wants to venture that date, I guess, is the, the day uh, 2040, 2050, whatever. But uh, I think we've at least decided it's not going to be 2020, right? So <laughs> thanks very much. Thank you, everyone, for your attention you. today. Let's have a hand for, uh, for these guys. Thank you.